we're going to pick up where we left off on Monday. And where we left off was we were dissolving stuff. We talked about how things dissolve. Why does something dissolve? Maybe in this solvent versus that. And how does it dissolve? And what makes them? And then we say, well, what if we had something and we wanted it to dissolve all the way until it couldn't dissolve anymore? Well, that's called saturation, right? And, and we talked about that. We talked about how if you had a general reaction, you know, maybe we had something like this, right? A, A plus B, B goes to and comes back from C, C plus D, D, then this reaction can happen in both ways, right? And so the general concept that we called a reaction quotient, reaction Q, is equal to, remember, it's equal to the concentrations raised to those stoichiometric coefficients. And it's the products over the reactants. OK, so that's what we, now, then we, we say, well, OK, that's just, OK, that's a thing that, that has to do with sort of maybe, you know, where's that reaction going? What's dominating? Uh, it, and these came, remember, these uh, are the stoichiometric coefficients, and they're related to literally like the probability that that reaction can happen. OK? Um, and so if you want an intuitive reason for the exponents, you can think about this as, well, if these all have to get close enough in a given volume to react, then that's where those exponents come from. Yeah, but they don't, but the, unlike the rate law, and I said this Monday, I'm saying it again today, they are not things that are experimentally measured. Instead, they just come from the reaction itself. Okay? Now, uh, so we're just getting back into the right mood here. All right, but then we said, well, but look, OK, this thing is reacting. It's going back and forth, whatever. But what about once it reaches equilibrium? Right? Equilibrium. And, and when it reaches equilibrium, it's the same thing, but we call it KEQ in equilibrium. Equi M, equilibrium, right? So, so that reaction quotient has a very specific value, a constant, a constant once this way is happening in the same amount as that way, right? That's the saturation point. Well, if you're dissolving something, that's the saturation point. Okay, so it's where, it's where the precipitation, remember we wrote this as dissolution and precipitation when we were putting stuff in solution, and that's kind of where we got to. Well, we went a little bit further, and we had a specific example, and that's where I want to start today, and that's silver chloride. Okay, so here we go. So we have silver chloride, and if I write this all out for silver chloride, I've got AgCl, and I've got a little pinch of it. You know, like a little speck of silver chloride. I'm putting it into a beaker. So it starts out as a solid, and I add some water to it. And the water is L, because it's everywhere. It's the liquid. It's the solvent. Okay? It's the liquid that I'm dissolving it in. And we say, well, okay, that's going to go like this. So that reaction, it's going to give us silver ions. Remember? Salts. We did salts and chlorine ions and back to some more water, OK? That's H2O. Now, uh, the, the AQ means aqueous. These are now, because it's a salt, right? No, these are now dissolved ions because it's a salt. So we write them like that. And we know we got water everywhere. And so oftentimes, we leave the water out. Oftentimes, we don't really write the water because it's on both sides. And anyway, we don't, the water, the water is just surrounding stuff. It's not necessarily being consumed. The concentration of the water isn't changing. The water is the water in the liquid phase. Well, OK, and then we went even further. We said, well, if you write a KEQ for this, then it would, uh, well, it would look like something like, OK, it's the concentration of silver plus uh, in solution times the concentration of chlorine minus in solution. And that would be divided by the concentration of silver chloride as a solid. And then we said, but hold on. 
Uh, but hold on. In the solid phase, the concentration isn't changing, right? As a solid silver chloride, the concentration of silver chloride is silver chloride. It's a constant. And so then we said, well, OK, if this is a constant, this is a constant. Then we can also absorb it into the equilibrium constant. And I somewhat confusingly wrote it as KSP in both this form and the form that we know and love for KSP, which is simply literally the solubilities of these times each other, right? And that is KSP. So I wanted just to clarify this because a student asked a very good question, which is, which is, which is it? Now, is this in KSP or is this in KEQ? Well, the, 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 the big full picture for KEQ you know, you'd write it all in. But the solubility product is focusing in, right, on, on the, the dissolution of these ions. And, and so you wrap this into the equilibrium constant because it's another constant. So that's the solubility product. And that's where we got to on Monday. The solubility product is a special equilibrium constant where what we're talking about, right, is is you know what is, what are the concentrations when you've reached saturation of this dissolution precipitation reaction okay that's the solubility product that's ksp so you wrap this in and you get you get your ksp I, you can think about it as well maybe you could have called this some ksp in you know uh, uh, pre-KSP, and then you wrap this in, and then it's still just given, because it's still just a constant representing this reaction, okay? I just wanted to make this super clear, because this part leads to confusion often that this gets left out, because it's constant and it doesn't change. Okay, good. Now we get to that, because this is a constant. All right, okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means that if I dissolve this thing in water, right, then, then the equilibrium, the equilibrium is, is a fixed number. This equilibrium product is fixed, and that has a very important meaning. It's the green curve. You see, it says equilibrium. Right? And, and so that, what that means is that if, I, you know, if I'm at point B, well, there I go. I've got my, we, we said KSP. KSP for this one equals, uh, what was it, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10th. Units are coming. And so now, so that's the KSP for, uh, for silver chloride in H2O. Oh, and you have to say at some temperature. It will depend on temperature. Often, you often will just be at room temperature, 25C, for example. So often these get quoted just at room temperature, OK? Now, OK, so once I know that, then I know that that's equilibrium no matter what, right? And so that means that if my, you know, and then we solved this, we said, well, OK, if I dissolve silver chloride then I didn't, and I had nothing else, then you know, the KSP would equal the concentration of silver times the concentration of chlorine ions. And so if we let each one, but those are equal. And so if we let each one of them be x, then it's equal to x squared. And so we know that the concentration of each of them is 10 to the minus, let me write it exactly, 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth. Now, it's a concentration. So you know that it's got to be capital M, moles per liter. And, and since that's the case, since that's where you know what it is, then now you can back up because this is the concentration of Ag ions and it's also the concentration of chlorine ions. Then you know that the, the units of Ksp must be m squared, right? Units in this case. Moles per liter squared, must be because otherwise the concentration isn't right. The units of concentration are right. Okay, now, okay, now we're gonna play with this. So, okay, so I'm at B, I'm at point B. You see that? There I am. 
Well, and I've got my concentration of chlorine, concentration of silver, and I'm here. And, and so that's 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth. Okay. Now, if I, if I didn't have as much, if I, didn't, if I weren't at the saturation point, right, then I could add more. I'd be here. And I could add more solid silver chloride, and I, you know, and eventually I'd reach this, uh, I'd reach this, this equilibrium. But if I added more than that, so I'm, now I'm adding way more than I can, then it's just going to be a solid. And that's kind of boring. So now I'm up here. Well, maybe I add ions in. So these are the ions. So maybe I add a whole bunch of ions. Well, they're just going to precipitate. I can't be here and be in equilibrium. That's the point of the green curve. This K doesn't change. This K is, is this K. That's what the green curve is. It is that being constant. That's very important. That is equilibrium. Now, there is a way, though, to move around on it. Yeah? Because if I did, imagine now, look at point C. Now, imagine now that I've, I've found some source of chlorine ions. And I add a whole bunch of them, right? A whole bunch of them into this solution. I don't add silver and chlorine together. I just add chlorine. Well, you can see what's going to happen. I have to get to equilibrium. And so in order to stay in equilibrium for silver chloride in solution, then I must lower my concentration of silver because I added all this chlorine. Right? Well, the only way to do that is to eat up some silver and precipitate. That's the only way to do that. And, and that has a name, and that's what I want to talk about next. That is called the common ion effect. Now, this is an example, this is an example of a broader principle, which is which I mentioned Monday, which is Le Chatelier's principle. Okay. Mm. Uh, and that is that uh, position of position of equilibrium will move. That, it's still equilibrium, but it's moving on that green curve, right, to counteract change. This is a very uh, general principle. It applies to many, many things. It does not just concentrations. It applies to changes in pressure and other changes that you can make in a system. Here we care about concentration. And in this particular case, uh, we're going to see it for what happens when you add ions right, of one particular type and not the other. That's the common ion effect. But it's a very general effect that it resists the change. Now, let's see how that works. If I, um, if I want a source of ions, let's say I want a source of chlorine, one way would be to add a whole bunch of sodium chloride. Right? So let's suppose that I have, um, OK, so I'm going to add, uh, as an example, I'm going to add to this nice equilibrium that I reached here. So I'm at point B, OK? And I'm going to add uh, 0.1 mol, uh, moles per liter of sodium chloride. And this nearly, and so we're going to say it does, it nearly fully dissociates. And we'll be talking about that later today. And so that means that, that this goes, NaCl basically goes to Na plus plus Cl minus, both in solution. So if I put point, if I put point 0.1 moles per liter of, of sodium chloride into this, into this uh, uh, container of the silver chloride, I'm basically going to get point 0.1, because of the stoichiometric coefficient, 1, 1, 1, right? Yeah, so if I put 0.1 moles per liter of this, I'm going to have 0.1 moles per liter of chlorine ions that I just dumped into the container. But the sodium doesn't, it died, the sodium's not going to do anything. But, it's just the, the, but look at the chlorine. That's going to mess with my equilibrium. But K is a constant. So let's see what happens. We can do it. We can do it visually, but we can also do it back when we use the ice table, right? So, we'll, so now we're going to go ice again. AG. CL, 
And here's uh, Ag plus, okay, and here's Cl minus. So now I've added the, okay, so my initial is that this is solid. Remember, it's, it's, this is the, the solid of the, that I'm putting in there. And then I, I started, my initial is that I started in that nice equilibrium at point B. So I've got 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth. And over here, I've got the same. But now the change. Now the change. We're going to add, OK, so we're going to add some chlorine ions, 0 0.1. So I've added 0 0.1 moles per liter of chlorine ions from the salt, from sodium chloride. Yeah, but now some of that is going to react. Because I, as I just said, Le Chatelier's principle tells me that now there's, it's got to counter that. And you can see it right here, too. I'm adding a whole bunch of chlorine. So I'm going, look at how far I'm going out, 0.1. That's like literally all the way out to here. And so, and so the amount of silver has got to go down. And it, what's going to happen is it's going to consume some of the silver and form precipitate to counter all this addition. It's going to run the reaction the other way. So it's going to lose a little bit there uh, from the 0.1. That's going to react with the silver ions, so that's going to also lose, and this is going to gain. That's how much that's going to gain. So those are the variables, right? This is the ice table. That's how much, how much it's going to lose. These are going to react to give me some precipitate. And so the equilibrium is more, OK, more solid forms. That's not a good E. More solid forms. And over here, it's 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth minus x. And over here, it's 0 0.1 minus x. That's the equilibrium condition. I've added in a common ion. This is the common ion effect. And so now, if you do the math, then what happens? Well, again, KSP is the same. It's the equilibrium constant, so it's the constant. So that is going to be the same value. It's going to be 1.7 times 10 to the minus 10th. But you see, KSP is also equal to the concentration in equilibrium of the silver ions times the concentration of the chlorine ions. So it's going to be 0 0.1 minus x times 1.3 times 10 to the fifth minus x. And then we don't like doing all this math, and so we simplify. And then we can simplify, because look, you started with silver ions in a very small concentration. X can't be, you can't take away something you don't have. Right? And, and, and so X has got to be somehow this or less, right? <laughs> and so X is a small number, and this is a really big number in comparison. And so we like simplifying our lives, right? And so we, we like saying that that's like 0.1. We know that. That'll make the math a lot easier, right? That'll make the, the math a lot easier. And so now we can say that this is equal to, uh, OK, 0 0.1 times 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth minus x. And then we get that x equals 1.7 times 10 to the minus ninth. That is the common ion effect. What I've done, I've taken this thing in equilibrium and I've added one of the ions, right? And, and, and it changes the solubility. Remember, the solubility is what we care about. That's what the solubility product, the, the solubility constant helps us determine. And I've literally just changed it by orders of magnitude, right? Because now the, the amount that this, so this thing precipitates like crazy. I added in a little bit of some other ion, that, some other salt that had chlorine ions, and all of a sudden, silver chloride precipitates out. Right? So here's a video of that. So this is kind of cool. So watch. This is a, an equilibrium uh, container, and what I'm adding is salt. And look at that. What is that? That's silver chloride precipitate. right? Because the thing has to reach equilibrium, and so in order to do so, what you do is you, you suppress the solubility. You literally, by adding chlorine, the common ion effect, you suppress the solubility of the silver chloride. 
right? It's pretty cool stuff. That is the common ion effect. Now, why does this matter? Oh, let, let me give you one. I'll get to why this matters in a second. One more question. So you can now, without even doing the math, check this one out. This is cool. Without even, do, without even doing the math, I can take barium sulfate, OK? And from this, from the common ion effect, so barium sulfate is going to go, so what does that one look like? Well, it's going to go to Ba2 plus, plus SO4, 2 minus, both in solution. In solution, dissolved ions, this is a solid. Now, which, here's the question. Which of the following will be required in the least amount to dissolve the same amount of BaSO4? I don't need any constants or math. I can use the same principle. Because if I had some 0.1 molar or 0.01 uh, moles per liter of either of these, what are they doing? They're serving up ions, right? In the one case, you're serving up, in the one case, you're serving up, uh, so in case A, you're going to give me, um, what do I have there? H2SO4. So let's do A first. H2 SO4 is going to give me a whole bunch of H plus, but also SO4 2 minus. And in case B, you have uh, uh, BaCl. OK, so you have BaCl2. And if I put that in, I've got this in water, right? But if, I put, but if this dissolves in water a little bit, then it's going to serve up some Ba2 plus plus 2 Cl minus. Either way, now you know what's going to happen. Because if I'm trying to dissolve something and I add any of the ions that it's dissolving into from some external source, it's going to drive it this way. It's going to precipitate. Right? So the answer has to be just water. Stick with pure water in this case. Otherwise, you're going you're to have more trouble dissolving, just like we just showed. You're going to have more trouble dissolving, not less. That's the common ion effect. Right? Now, why the, OK, so now, why does this matter? Why does this matter? Uh -huh. We go back to the pteropod. And by the way, I didn't have this link, and I should have, when I showed you the, the and this is your goodie bag, et cetera. Right? There's some really nice uh, articles here that you can find related to these experiments and other things about ocean acidity, and, uh, in case you're interested. Um, but see. What, we, what I did is, was that this was my Why This Matters on Monday, and I, I wanted to tell you about the goodie bag and about the, how things dissolve. Because Monday was about dissolving right, and finding a saturation point. Now we can, we can get to the next place, which is why does that matter for the pteropod shell? What is the chemistry that, that matters there? OK, so I made the ocean a little more acidic. Why does that matter? But you see, now we're armed with the knowledge we need to answer that question. Now we're armed with it. All we need to do, as always with everything in life, is look at the chemistry. That's it. Say that at the Thanksgiving table. You'll be very popular. We said CO2 plus H2O. This goes, oh, find some equilibrium, to H2CO3. Now this is called carbonic acid. This is called carbonic acid. There's the pteropod up there. And there's a reaction that's, that's really relevant that you'll see from the ones we're about to write down why. Because the thing is, that why, why, what happens to carbonic acid? That, well, well, carbonic acid also goes through a dissolution reaction. So carbonic acid, so this is CO2 dissolving in water. Now we made carbon. So carbonic acid uh, goes like this. OK, it goes into HCO3 minus plus H plus. Now, here's the thing. OK, what is the shell made of? Well, the shell that's dissolving in, in its you know, kind of like the core material is calcium carbonate. So that's CaCO3. That's the shell. And the shell also has an equilibrium reaction that happens. 
The shell of, of, a, of a sea uh, creature is in dynamic equilibrium with the ocean. And, and so it's going like this. It's going to, uh, well, okay, CA2 plus and CO3 2 minus. And, 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 okay, but the thing is, it has an equilibrium constant. All these have equilibrium constants. So like, for example, for this one, the KSP, the solubility product constant, because this is a solid. This is a solid shell. Solid going to ions in aqueous solution. Well, so the KSP for that is somewhere around 5 times 10 to the minus 9th. 5 times 10 to the minus 9th. Yeah, but here's the thing. We just went through this. If I consume one of these or change the concentration of one of these and not the other, we just did this. If I, if I change the concentration, if I consume any of these, then I might drive the reaction, or consume or produce. If I change any of these independently, I'm going to drive the reaction because that's how we keep to our K. That's what Le Chatelier's principle tells us. And so what ends up happening is you've got the extra H plus ions. So these are ions in solution. Where did they come from? They came from the CO2 giving us carbonic acid, which then gave us H plus. Those are what I'm talking about. Well, they react with the CO3 minus. CO3 2 minus. This lowers the CO3 2 minus concentration near the shell, right? Because in tight. And if I lower this, because I've taken some of this now and I've reacted it, so now I've got less of it. And because of what we just saw, if I've got less of this, you're going to drive this way, which is going to dissolve more of the shell, right? That's why this works. Or, well, that's why this, this happens. Works sounds like a positive thing, right? So this lowers the concentration of CO3 2 minus, and that drives more dissolution. That is what's happening. And we now can understand it in terms of the concepts that we've just learned. You know, historically, I mentioned 50 million years. Actually, by some accounts, it's 300 million. It depends on which studies you read. But, but for at least 50 and maybe as much as 300 million years, the ocean uh, uh, has had a pH of 8.18. Uh, now, where's the, oh, yeah. right? So let's just say, you know, last, oh, 50 to 300 million-ish years, the ocean pH was 8.18. And today, it's uh, 8.07. And the prediction is that in 2100, it will be 7.8. Now, as we will see in a little bit, and he said, what's pH? Well, I, many of you probably already know, but we, I will tell you what it is in a little bit. But because this is a logarithmic thing, this is a lot. Right? Today, the ocean is 25% more acidic than it's been in 300 million-ish years. Uh, and, and in 2100, it will be 126% more acidic. That's why they used 7.8 in, in the experiments of the pteropods. OK. Okay. Right. Why does this happen? Why is this molecule an acid? We're talking about acidification of oceans. Why is this an acid in the first place? What does it mean to be an acid? And that is the next topic. That is what I want to talk about next. Why, what is an acid? And an acid is something that is very uh, specific. It has a very definite uh, a meaning to it. And I want to talk about that today. Um, and then we'll continue after the break. All right? So this molecule, carbonic acid is called an acid because of that proton. And you could feel it. Right? You could feel it in this, in this whole thing. The proton is the, is the thing that did the, caused the problem. right? 
an acid, this is an acid because of the proton. So an acid is, it's, it's a dissolution reaction. Dissolution. It's what we've been talking about. It's a dissolution reaction that gives an H plus. And so now if I think about it as kind of a generic case, generic acid A, then the reaction looks something like this. I'm going to call out the acid and the proton that it gives separately. Right? OK? So this is HA. So we do this because it highlights that it's an acid. H plus in solution, and these can all be in solution, plus A minus in solution. Right? H plus A minus. Right? So I've taken a proton off. You see it's right there. That's, that's HA. HA, where A is HCO3 and, and H is H. And then what I've done is I've transferred the proton into solution. That's an acid. Now, um, the thing is, one of the things, now you will see a lot of, of places and people writing H plus. And we will do that too, because so many textbooks use H plus. Um, but the thing is that H plus, what I want you to know is that H plus is never a thing. We just write it that way. H plus is not stable in water. So the, the proper, ah, the proper way to write this general reaction would be HA plus H2O, okay, is gonna go to, and now I'm gonna write the full, right, so the full goes both ways, is gonna go to H3O plus plus A minus. Gesundheit. This is what happens, because H plus is not stable in water. But you will see H plus written all over the place. When you see H plus, and if it's in water, know that it's H3O plus. That is what is stable. OK? H plus in water is not. Now, there's something here that's important in terms of terminology. And that is that these are, notice that these are related. right? The HA and the A minus seem very related, and the H2O and the H2O, uh, H3O plus seem very related. Well, they are, because they're just, a, a proton is the only difference between them. And so those are called conjugate pairs. Conjugate, related. Conjugate pairs. OK? Those are called conjugate pairs. Now, back in the day, uh, there was a lot of interest. People knew about these kind of liquids. You know, mostly liquids for a long time. And there was a lot of experimentation before this. Let's say, well, there's these general classes of materials. We're going to call them A and B. Well, A seems to always taste kind of sour. Uh, uh, B is bitter. A reacts with carbonates to make CO2. B reacts with fats and soap to make soaps. All right? uh, one reacts with metals, the other doesn't. And by the way, if we mix them together, we seem to always get salt and water. This had been going on for centuries, this investigation into properties of acids and bases. But who was it that came along? Who was it that came along? Svante, is there anything you can't do, Svante? I ask you, again, in the late 1800s, it was Svante to the rescue who first proposed that what is happening here is a dissolution reaction. That is what an acid or base is. It is that, in, on the one hand, you're given an H+, plus, which is what I just said. But on the other hand, for a base, you're given an OH-. And it was Svante Arrhenius who first put that down and first conceived of acids and bases. Are we snapping? Are we quiet snapping for Svante? I love it. I've just recently learned what that means. It makes me happy. Quiet snapping. It's instead of clapping, but you don't want to make noise, but you still want to give props. I got it. I'm there. I'm right there. Now, OK, so uh, OK, now, here's the thing. So we'll talk about it. So uh, OK, Arrhenius says bases give OH ions in solution, and oh, acids give H plus. But we know that that's H3O plus. OK, we know that. OK. Yeah, but the thing is, there, there's a dissolution reactions. 
these things lead to really small concentrations. And so Soren Sorensen, that is a beer bottle. By the way, his research was funded by a beer company. Yeah, and, and it was all about the taste of beer. <laughs> he called it looking at proteins. But it was about beer. And what he realized, he's uh, I'm doing all these dissolution reactions of ions. I think Arrhenius was right. You know, ions are really important. Uh, and we're, we're trying to measure these things. And, but I'm sick of all these zeros. I don't like writing 0. 0.0001 or whatever all the time. And, and so now look at that, 1.3 times 10 to the minus fifth. That's not efficient. And so what Sorensen did is he talked about how you've got the power. Now, what do I mean by power? So many things, right? But if I look at H plus, OK, H3O plus, and I say, let's suppose the concentration is 0 0.0, oh boy, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. That's 10 to the minus 7th. But, but Sorensen wasn't happy with that. That's still, you simplified it. Wait, 2, 4, no, it's not. OK, maybe it is now. <laughs> he said, well, 10 to the minus 7th is still four characters I got to write. Four. And so he went to the math department at his place, and he said, how do you, what else could mean? I want to talk about the power of these ions. And they're like, power? Well, that's the logarithm. And, and so if you take the log, it's the power of hydrogen. Power of hydrogen is the pH. And that's simply minus the log. Well, they didn't want negative numbers either. Oh, but you can have negative pH. You can. Why? Because this is the definition of pH. Right? Or you could do pOH, since if you're going with Arrhenius, right? So the power of hydrogen is the pH. The pOH would be minus log of the concentration of OH minus. That's the pOH. But pH is the one that we most often see to describe whether something is acidic or basic. Right? And so now you see, well, if the, you know, OK, well, this is a pH. Now this is easy, right? It's a pH of 7. And, and if the concentration were like 0.1, it would be a pH of 1, right? Minus log, the power of hydrogen. The log, literally, the log, OK? Now, if you look at scales of pH, and, and it's a really fun thing to do, then what you find is that usually, almost always, actually, you'll see the scale ranging from 0 to 14. That's what Sorensen originally Decided, I'm, I'm going to talk about these ions in solution. I don't want to write it out every time. I'm just going to have a simple scale. We'll take the minus log, and there you go. Yeah, but you can see that if the, if the concentration is more than 1 here, then you could have negative pHs. There's nothing special about 0 here. It just so happens that most things, certainly that he was playing with at the time, were in this scale. And here's a few things that we know. There it is, right? OK, back, don't play with that one. But play with lemon juice, vinegar. By the way, vinegar, OK, wine is around 3 and a half. Vinegar is around 2. You know? Vine the, the word vinegar is von egar. It's eager wine. <laughs> That's it, right? And, but, and it comes, it's because of the, the acidity. The acidity. Well, it's more than that, but it's the acidity is changing by orders of magnitude, power. Right? And then you can go back and you say, well, OK, there's coffee. I like that a lot, and, and blood. <laughs> by the way, by the way, talk about ocean acidity. Blood has a very narrow range of pH. And if you change the pH of your blood by more than 0.2, it is very likely to lead to death. Right? So just think about it. That's what we're doing to the ocean. OK, anyway, that was an aside. <laughs> Seawater, oh, pH 8.07 currently and dropping, right? Uh, OK, baking soda. So this is uh, very powerful, no pun intended, actually. Um, uh, uh, now, these are dissociation reactions. These are dissolution reactions. I'm taking an acid, and I'm dissociating it in water. And so you have equilibrium constants for that dissociation, right? And so, and so if, you, if you go back to. 
to that, you know, that's still going to matter here. And that's going to be important in thinking about what an acid is. Because again, why is it acidic? Well, because there's these protons. Well, how many of them are there? It depends on how it dissolved. Where did it find its equilibrium, right? And so for some of them, like I just wrote, you know, we, we just talked about HCl plus uh, H2O. That went to uh, H3O plus plus uh, Cl minus, okay? Now, the thing is, if I had, if I had 0 0.1 moles per liter of HCl, then it's going to lead to a concentration of H3O plus of around 0.1 moles per liter because it's nearly full, nearly full dissociation. What, is, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that, yeah, OK, you know, so you'll often see for like an acid like that, one arrow. Well, we know that in reality, there's another arrow there. But see, here, the acid dissociation constant is huge. Right? So now we have a thing for the equilibrium of an acid, which forms by dissociating the acid into its you know, ions. Right? And this is, well, for in this case, it's 10 to the sixth. It's enormous, which means that the equilibrium lies very, 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 very far over. And so oftentimes, you'll see if it's going to strongly dissociate it, like sodium chloride did, right? then you'll sometimes see it written as just one arrow. But there's a little bit going back as well. Right? That is another equilibrium constant. And we will talk about Ka a little later and probably uh, pick up on it next week. OK, now, um, so near full dissociation. Now, um, the other thing that can happen that's important is water can do both. And so there's, there's uh, let's see, where should I go? I'll go back over here. So water, see that picture there? They got it wrong. But it's OK. They got it right, because we all get along. If you want to put H plus, fine. But you know that it's actually H3O plus. OK, good. But you can put H plus, no problem. OK. Um, now, there it is. And you can see that what water can do is it can do both. And that turns out to be extremely important. So if I take water and I mix it with water, <laughs> then you can get a combination of these ions. Oh, plus a whole bunch of water. So this would be like uh, dissociation. Now, there's a word for this. Water can turn into either. Right? It, can, it can be basic or acidic. It can, it can deliver OH minus or H3O plus. Right? That's called autoionization. And it also has a special word. Water is called amphoteric. Amphoteric. Now, that means that the same thing can be both, both acid or a base. It can act as either. Now, so if you take pure water, so let's see. If I take pure water and Oh, and I look at the concentrations of these. Uh, so H3O plus, it's all happening from the water. There's nothing in it. I didn't add anything to it. It's just pure water, H3O plus. So that means that you know, if that reaction happens, it's going to generate you know, the same number. So the H3O plus would equal the concentration of the OH minus, and in pure water, that is a value that is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 7th moles per liter at 25C, OK? At 25C. And so now we have yet another. That's neutral. You can understand that that's neutral because 
because it, you have the same, it, you know, if an acid is H plus or H3O plus in solution and, and a base is OH minus, and I've made the same number, right? Uh, then they neutralize, the acidity and basicity are, are neutralizing one another, so that's neutral. And in fact, you can see that that's uh, pH is seven. Oh, and we can even write the equilibrium constant for water, which is going to be those guys, H3O minus times, oh, H3O plus times OH minus, which is equal to 10 to the negative 14th, right? Because that's the dissociation reaction for water. Water plus water goes to those ions in solution. We ignore the water, right? And, and then we're left with this same thing we've been doing, okay? 10 to the minus 14th. Now, that takes us, we neutral, you know, those are neutral. And, and, and so speaking of, of neutral, that's where we're going to go next. And uh, I think what I want to do now is, you know, so we're going to go next into neutralizing things. So like if you add an acid to a base or if you add a base to an acid, and, and we already said on Monday you get salt and water. Um, and, but see, to understand that, you need a different, you need a broader definition. Svante is amazing, but Svante missed something. And, and so we need a different definition of acids and bases that's more general. And that's what we're going to start with on Monday. But wait, because this is a great place for me to work on my arm, I got to hit, OK. We're going to go all the way up there and all the way up there and right there and right there and oh there and there and there and there. <laughs> well, that was excitement. Let's go back there and there. Well, OK. And there. Oh, that was the same direction there and there. And there, in the middle, and there, and there. Oh, that was there, and there, and there, and there. You guys are seeing I need, I need a stronger arm here. Ah, I can't really get too far. And, uh, uh, and oh, that side is all in there, and there. And there. And one more. I'm going deep. Have a great Thanksgiving, everyone. See you guys on Monday.